Hi, I'm David Gregg with the Rhode Island Natural History Survey. The video you're about to watch is from a bee science symposium that we organized here at University of Rhode Island's East Farm campus, and it was held on October 5th. We had nine presenters at the symposium, and over the next little while, we'll be putting out videos of most of their presentations. So if you weren't able to make it for the Pollinator Science Symposium, you come to the right spot. This first video includes my introduction to the symposium and a presentation by Steve Alm, who is a professor at URI and is the organizer of most of the bee research that takes place here at East Farm. In my introduction, I'll explain the thinking behind this symposium and how it relates to the Natural History Survey's mission, and other videos won't have as long an introduction. The Rhode Island Natural History Survey presents videos to showcase the animals, plants, geology, and natural systems that surround us, and the people and organizations working to understand and conserve them. So I um, <coughs> I'm, a, I'm an archaeologist and anthropologist by training, but I started off as an entomologist. I started collecting butterflies when I was 13, and um, any of you who've known me for a while know I have the entomological attention span of a gnat, and I've, I've jumped from one taxon to another. In my interests, I've done, I did butterflies on Cape Cod, but the diversity is, is sort of impoverished there, so I quickly ran out of butterflies, and then I, I tried moths because, well, they're Lepidoptera too, and um, I got all the colorful ones, and then I realized all the rest were brown and looked the same, <laughs> so I was on to beetles, but that's even worse. Um, you run out of colored ones, and man, then you're really in trouble. So <clears throat> at some point, <clears throat> about 2008 or nine, I uh, was contacted by Jerry Stage, who I don't know, some of you may know. Um, uh, he's, he's passed now, but he was a really interesting character. Um, and he was working with Sean Kent to try to replicate a survey of bees that he made on the Elizabeth Islands in the 70s, which was pretty early for a bee survey. And uh, I was like, oh, bees, that's a thing now. I've heard about pollinators, so I'm going to, I should do bees. <laughs> and so I got really interested in bees, and I followed Jerry around for a little while. <clears throat> um, but they're hard, they're kind of hard. And so I haven't sort of gone too far down the bee path. At one point, I took all my bees from Rhode Island and from the Elizabeth Islands, and I sent them to John Asher. <clears throat> and, and so I really don't have any bees left. Um, uh, and, uh, but I'm still interested in them, and I understand that they're important. So <clears throat> when I, I started meeting some of you, um, Katie had just come to Rhode Island, and I said, well, do you, have you met Steve Alm yet? And she said, no. <laughs> I said, well, have you met Harry Ginsburg yet? No. So, and, and there were sort of every, I sort of meet you guys in passing and you would say, oh yeah, I've been meaning to meet, you know, sort of Howie, but I haven't met him yet. And I said, okay, that's it. You know, we, in the COVID days, we don't do, you know, we, we aren't going to do a big conference that's a huge investment, but we're going to, yeah, this is really being borne out today. Um, we're going to have um, a research symposium, which is a lot easier to organize. And we're just going to have people get together and talk about their work. And that's kind of in the, on brand for the Natural History Survey. So the, the Natural History Survey is a, is a nonprofit. We're not a state agency, and we are actually not a unit of the University of Rhode Island, although we've been located here since 1994 when we were founded. The Natural History Survey was founded in order to try to create communication among people who know things about Rhode Island's biota and environment. And it's one of the, um, you know, one of the things that people are always complaining about Rhode Island for such a small state, we're all in these stovepipes and, and nobody ever talks to each other. And the Natural History Survey kind of recognized that we knew more collectively than any of us are aware of if we could just put the bits together. So if you have um, any ideas for other things that the survey can do to help your work out or um, to convene people that you would like to talk to or what have you, then just let me know. If you want to publish something, you've got some. One of the things some of you realize we do is we do a lot of fiscal agent work for projects that have complex combinations of funders or um, need to do hires that are outside of a, the state system or university system. 
Um, and so, you know, complicated complicated funding and complicated combinations of partners is, is something that we're flexible enough to be able to do. And in, and in this day and age, that counts for something. So um, by all means, let us know. So, you know, what, another example is that we, we just did the Odinata um, checklist of Rhode Island. And did, did we bring some down? I didn't, but yeah. I can bring some Okay, down. yeah, we'll bring some down. Um, <clears throat> and that's something that, you know, I just, I, I sort of knew was possible. And when um, Ginger Brown started working again on a sort of a revisiting some of the data from the Odinata Atlas for, for DEM, I said, well, let's, you know, let's put together a checklist because it's, it's au courant and people will be able to use it for things. And so, um, so we were able to just kind of do that because we have that flexibility. And we also have the support of our members. And so that's, you know, that's how we're able to do these things. We're a membership organization. I mean, and so, you know, I do want to sort of thank our membership for generously supporting the survey. And if you are a member, thank you. And if you are not yet a member, I encourage you. It can be as low as $15 if you're a student. Um, and um, so I also wanted to take a moment to thank Kyra Stilwell, who's in the back. <laughs> Kyra is <laughs> the food fairy. Um, thanks, Kyra, for everything you do. Um, so uh, there are a couple of uh, one other major issue this morning, and that is Samantha Alger, who drove all the way down from Burlington to pre to be here today, is sick oh, and quite sick. And I hope it's not COVID. Uh, I hope it's only a regular disease. <laughs> um, <laughs> but I'm I'm really bummed because I um, well Samantha is from Rhode Island. She worked on burying beetles with Lou Parati and, and she and Lou and I went and did a survey of burying beetles on the Elizabeths uh, for three days and had a great time putting rotten chicken in holes in the ground. Um, and she's, and then she's gone on to get her PhD at UVM. And I don't want to say anything more about, you know, take any words, you know, out of her mouth about what her work is, but I will just say the article. So I read an article by her in PLOS um, one, and it was in it was published in June of 2019, and the title is "RNA Virus Spillover from Managed Honeybees to Wild Bumblebees," and she's got um, four uh, uh, three other um, co-authors. But I'll just read the the final sentence of her abstract, which is. Our results corroborate the hypothesis that viruses are spilling over from managed honeybees to wild bumblebees and that flowers may be an important route for transmission. And so if you, if you, we're hoping we can get Samantha to do a uh, remote talk on this subject at a later date. Um, but regardless, or if you can't wait to read about that, it's in PLOS One from June of 2019. And um, what I liked particularly liked about the paper, and this is sort of coming from <clears throat> my background with the Natural History Survey, is that it is sort of a tour de force of interdisciplinary work, because you needed like DNA, you know, molecular biologists, and you needed to talk about, you know, sort of the microbiome of leaves and flowers, which is pretty undiscovered country, um, and behavior of the different bees, and then you also had to interact so this was primarily on um, pollinator strips on in agriculture. So you also had to interact with agricultural types, and so it's just and just fantastic um, paper. I thought both methodologically and in its results. So um, so that's kind of my my pitch for Samantha's work in the absence of her, of her um, today. So um, Nicholas Dorian. Um, canceled at the last minute. He's from Tufts, and um, he gave a really interesting paper at the Northeast Natural History Symposium last year in Albany, in which he talked about, you know, like, <laughs> when we all grow up from doing species inventories and want to really dig into what individual species do, you know, here's how we could do it, or, or don't be afraid to do it, because, you know, he, he'd done a study that that, that talked about how many different kinds of bees are identifiable on the wing without having to drown them in bee bowls. Um, and so I was like, I was blown away. I mean, it's a great sort of natural historical approach. Like maybe we should just go outside and look at stuff and see what it's doing, which is, you know, it's kind of radical. Um, and, you know, in natural history has spent 
you know, sort of my joke is that natural historians have spent you know, 170 years putting dead things in rows, and that's kind of you know the state of the art uh, you know for bee surveys. It certainly was when I started, and, and Sean Kent showed me what bee bowls were. I was like, that's so cool, 300 dead bumblebees. Um, but then you know there's more to it. And I, I thought so. So I wanted Nick to come down and talk about that work, and you know hopefully we'll get him another time because I thought his paper in Albany was really cool. I don't have any. Particular, I sort of randomized your order today. Um, I tried to keep the Providence College folks and the URI folks together in their in their respective groups because that would probably make more sense. <laughs> um, but uh, I, I'd, Steve has agreed to start. So, Steve, you want to sure. go ahead and kick us off? So, Steve, Steve is also kind of a, a co-host today because all the B stuff that happens here at East Farm is is his is his at one level or other. So, Zach Scott is our, our first master's student here. In about 2014, we started work on bees, and it was a pretty simple study. It was going to 15 different blueberry growers in Rhode Island and just surveying bees. And uh, so he'd go, he'd do transects up and down the rows, collect the bees, bring them back, and similar to other studies in New York State and Canada, he collected 41 different species of bees. And the biggest thing to take away, I think, from Zach's work here was that the bumblebees and then Greenwich are, are very key. They're the top 10 pollinators early on in the season. And so these, a lot of these are queens, too, which is, so plant more blueberries, I guess, is, is the message, because they need it. And, um, and, uh, and then he, he looked at uh, the pollen loads and percent blueberry pollen that they were uh, carrying and of course you know bigger bees are carrying bigger loads and transferring more pollen and and the flower fidelity was quite good uh, they most of them except we'll talk a little bit more about large carpenter bee here in a bit but uh, it has a pretty low load but the other ones are pretty high in their flower fidelity um, and you know the the uh, if you're not familiar with the blueberry flower, it has these porocidal anthers, and the bees have to sonicate or buzz pollinate bees to get the pollen out. So the, the bees grab onto their mandibles, unhook their wing muscles, vibrate them so they can shake out the very sticky pollen. And so all those top ten bees are buzz pollinators. Just and this, when we were when we were doing the, the research and, and writing up the paper, we came across a couple papers where here's your, your natural range of the cinium corambulsum, the high bush blueberry, and uh, they they've taken it out here, uh, you know, to grow them out west, but they didn't take the bees with them. And so, this is one paper by Button and L. They said. You could uh, you could increase your yield three thousand to seven thousand dollars per acre if you had adequate pollination. I I was kind of blown away by that statement. And and then there's even more data by um, Gibbs at all 2016 in in uh, Michigan even Michigan which is in the native range even they have a pollination deficit there of a thousand dollars per acre and six thousand in British Columbia. So I, I just think, again, you, to tell people you just can't move bees and plants around. Uh, <laughs> and, uh, so other thing that I think we learned from some of Zach's work was that uh, purple dead nettle was very important uh, for the queens and bees. We see them on that as well as the blueberries early on in the season. And we need real a lot more early season plants, I think, for these, these uh, queens that are just starting their colonies. Uh, and to tell the difference between handbit and purple bed nettle, yeah, the, the leaves are kind of in a skirt here, whereas the I, I think of a purple heart for the, the purple dead nettle is the kind of heart shaped leaf. Uh, but we we found you know we get, we have some pretty good plantings out here where you just we just rototilled it and the and the dead nettle came up, and so we're just trying to get people to not not get rid of it if they can't leave it because it's, it's quite important. Uh, the other thing, you know, uh, Pieris duponica, 
um, the uh, Japanese Andromeda. It's one of the earliest flowering plants out there, and, and we often see, we have a couple plants here, and we often see uh, queens on that as well. Now, again, you got purple dead nettle, you got two introduced plants. You know, what were they using, you know, way back when? What native <laughs> plants? Uh, we, we'd love to know that, but uh, I guess we'll, we'll, we'll make do, right? Mm -hmm. uh, then Sarah Tucker came along, and she worked on the uh, large carpenter bee. Um, these guys have a couple strikes against them already. You know, they bore holes in your house, in your, in your uh, fences, in your, in your decks, and whatever. Uh, but it was the fourth most common uh, bee that Zach found and in the blueberry uh, plantings in Rhode Island. And, uh, yeah, so one of the things they also do is they slit the corolla and they rob the nectar from the side. So this is strike two. <laughs> uh, but so one of our, uh, Sarah's question was, is that detrimental to fruit quality or yield? And she actually went out and tagged 42,000 flowers <laughs> uh, with different colored threads. Now they're open pollinated until she tags them. And then once she's got some that are in the same cluster that are unslit, then uh, she caged it and then followed them through to harvest. And basically her finding was that there was no difference in the sugars or the weight of the fruit. Now this is, we have a kind of a unique uh, planting down here. It's got a lot of cultivars, uh, maybe in some bigger plantings where it's all one cultivar. It may not work as well, but basically the other bees were picking up the slack. Uh, they didn't mind that the flower was slit. Uh, so they were coming in and pollinating anyway. Okay. Uh, she also looked at the nest, uh, nest structure. Uh, we planed a bunch of uh, wood and you know they'll come in and do these tunnels this way and, and this way and then they partition them, they, they scrape away at the sides to make these uh, particle board partitions in here. And then they have a pollen loaf that they, it's a pretty good size loaf because it's a pretty good size bee. And um, she um, made uh, measurements on all those. And so here's the loaves. And then we had we sent these up to Andrea Nurse at the University of Maine, palynologist up there. And she identified the pollen for us. And uh, yeah, so another, another strike, strike three. <laughs> what was that? They poison ivy. <laughs> <laughs> They collect a lot of poison ivy. But, but one of the kind of interesting things, I think, how you, you do you, they were collecting a lot of oak pollen, uh, tree pollen, hmm. um, that we, um, not, uh, you're not sure, you know, it's quite you don't think it's just, just, you know, accidental because there's oak pollen all over everything. Um, but, but some of the amounts were pretty high of that oak pollen in these different years here. And then, yeah, poison ivy came back here in year three, but uh, so I guess you're out. <laughs> <laughs> no, but if you go online, you know everyone's trying to kill carpenter bees, and we're trying to. So we're not. We didn't public no. We, we didn't public. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, this this uh, we had the master gardener. Some of them were very good word workers, and uh, we had them. We we made a couple different size. Uh, we trap nests, well, we want to not to trap them, but to provide, maybe pull them away from the houses and provide a, a location for the carpenter bees to set up. So we, we made it, uh, you know, per their instructions of uh, Sarah's measurements, and then we put them together and set them out there. But um, they didn't go for it. They didn't. They, we, it, you, they, they like it to do it themselves. <laughs> you can't. So what happened was we made some osmia nests. There were 230 osmia torus nests, 73 osmia cornifrons, and 8 osmia cornaria. So we, yeah. So you can't be too nice to these bees. Uh, 
a couple other, you know, these grass carrying lots, there were 151 of those in there. Uh, then, uh, <clears throat> so we're still looking for the redeeming qualities of large carbon. <laughs> <laughs> um, but uh, no, but they're good pollinators. Of, then Stephen Sapolsky came along, and we, uh, uh, you know, Japanese beetle feeds on 300 species of plants. It's uh, quite a pest. Uh, not so much around here anymore, but uh, um, the. They're, the western states have a quarantine. It's a USDA quarantine. And so they put up, California puts up 12,000 traps every year to around airports to see if they have them. If they find them, then they increase their trap density to 50 per square mile. They come in with insecticides, neonicotinoids, and they eliminate it because they don't want to uh, deal with it out there. And, um, so we were doing, we were collecting, uh, one of our colleagues asked uh, for some Japanese beetles for an experiment he wanted to do. And we said, yeah, we can collect some for you. But then we were seeing we were collecting bees. And then so we swapped out the bottom with a glass jar so we could see when we captured bees. And then we just let them go. But we were recording these. And uh, we said, and then we looked in the literature in, in 1965. Hamilton at all, they tried to trap out Japanese beetles on uh, Nantucket Island. And the first year, so each trap here equals a hundred traps. Holy and each smokes. bee equals a thousand bees. And these are bumblebees, just bumblebees. And so the first year they had 2,300 traps out there and they captured almost 23,000 bumblebees. The next year, they increased their traps a bit, but the bumblebees dropped to 6,000. <laughs> yeah, because they <laughs> killed them all. <laughs> and, then, and then the third year, they did oh the same number of traps, and they're down to 9,500. Yeah. Is that, is that more than they captured Japanese beetles? <laughs> uh, no. <laughs> but close. So um, they didn't think much of it at that time. <laughs> And, but uh, Stephen, we said, and you know, we looked at some other papers, you know, some traps um, are so attractive to beneficials that they are unacceptable for pest management. They're too darn good. <laughs> and uh, we know that uh, blue, yellow, white poles are used to trap bees, and so it's not surprising that a yellow top trap is going to catch Japanese beetles. And then you add this. They have a dual lure system here. It's a floral lure and a pheromone. And in the floral lure, it's got this eugenol geraniol phenethylpropionate. And um, so Stephen separated these out and to see which one was most attractive. And every time we had the geraniol, which smells like uh, roses, right. that's, uh, the geraniol's here and geraniol here as well. Uh, that captured the most bees, and um, if you took out the geranial, though, it wasn't statistically different. And, and this used to be the standard floral lure at one time, and they just found that geranial, they just added it kind of as the, and towards the end. So you're really, uh, what, uh, you know, some of the bees, and in, in fact, one of our, we call it threatened bees in Rhode Island, Bombus Furbidus, uh, found a reference to they forage 15 meters or less from the, the nest, which if you increase your trap density or, uh, and then other bee, um, other bumblebees will go quite a bit further, you know, in the foraging and some more about 600 meters on average. But, um, if you increased your trap density to 50 per square mile, you you have a very good chance you're going to catch that bee in that Japanese beetle trap. Um, so the other thing Stephen looked at were um, color. So we had, uh, Tracy was very cooperative, the company that makes these. They made us a green, red, that's brown and that's black, <laughs> uh, trap. And then we made our own clear traps. Um, 
which were not supposed to catch bees. <laughs> but, but they were actually better than the yellow. Uh, There's some UV reflectance there okay, yeah. that's, yeah. that's pulling them in. And we, we actually see them, we have these rain gauges, and they're plexiglass, and we keep see bees in there. We say, oh, they're really not going for the water. And I think, I, there's something about that plexiglass. Yeah. Hmm. So we're, we're pursuing that a little bit. Further. And then there was, there was no statistical difference in these other traps. So we ended up coming up with a bee friendly trap that you remove the geranium and we, we hope, yet, Tracy will provide that. It's not in their cat. They do have the green trap in their catalog, but you have to ask for it, especially. And you know, they'll make up this without this geranium as well. But I hope California and some of these other states that put out thousands of traps will make a switch here. But, uh, okay, that's that's our stuff. <laughs> so far. Any questions? <laughs> yes. Does the bee friendly trap still catch? A good amount of these. Well, um, it does catch it does catch some for sure. Um, <clears throat> yeah. Okay. So. <clears throat> uh, <clears throat> yeah. yeah. I had the other oh. bar in my brain, but yeah, that's that, the bees. These are, <laughs> yeah, these are the bees. These are the bees. Okay. Mm. Yeah, yeah, I have a couple things. Yeah. Of course. Um, in our yard, um, you were asking about early. Food sources. I don't know if other people have had this. We have a large uh, pussy willow, mm -hmm. salix discolor, and they love that plant. Yeah. So that would be. Um, yeah. I was I was looking for it to be further over or higher up on the list, but those are the carpenter bees, so they don't know what they're doing. They're all on that. We also have a <laughs> we also have a cal calorie pair that the, the carpenter bees love because uh, that blooms early. And they go to that. Um, next, when I was doing pest control for the carpenter bees. I would have made those fake nests out of wood that had been aged for a year or more. Um, I don't know if it's, this is just purely observation, but they seem to like wood that's a little older. Um, so that would be a thought that I would have. Um, um, and um, then the Japanese uh, beetle traps, I'm drawing a blank, we use those at Wildwood Nursery. And we didn't get a lot of bumblebees, so I'm wondering what their lure was. But my other question is, we stopped getting a lot of Japanese beetle and got an awful lot of oriental beetles. Um, and in Rhode Island, it seems to me that the Japanese beetle issue, while still here, I don't know if they've been displaced by the oriental beetle, or that certainly seems to be what's going on. Yeah, that, that is one theory that the oriental beetle has kind of taken over. Um, but it also seems like the Japanese beetle on its on its migration west, the front is where it really oh, okay. it's it's really bad. And then and then uh, we actually one of my students, uh, Daryl Ramitard, he worked in Connecticut and he looked at Tiffia vernalis, which bring Tiffia, which is a parasitic wasp of Japanese beetles. Which they released, uh, USDA released in the fifties, and he found it in every county in Connecticut, and some at pretty high numbers. And so uh, there was another study. There's a there's a, uh, there's a fly, a winsome, winsome fly, that uh, is also seventy. So there's some places seventy percent of the beetles had the winsome fly. On its, uh, on its thorax, they lay the eggs on the thorax and were parasitized in some places in Connecticut as well. So hmm. between that and maybe even uh, uh, Penobacillus papillae, which is the milky spore disease, sure. yeah. that's, you can get maybe a low level. We can find it in grubs every once in a while here. Maybe it's only 5%, but you add up the 5, the 70, and the spring tithia, I think maybe it's exerting some control on Japanese beetles in these states. And, and if they, and as it moves further west, they'll hopefully catch up. 
Interesting. Yeah. Mm. But, uh, yes. Um, I was wondering with the um, blueberry study and the pollen loads that um, were looked at. Um, so there were both entrenants and bumblebees. So were they the actual like loads on the legs? Yes. And then for Andrina, how were those loads collected? Yeah, he he pulled off the leg. Oh, okay, nice. Yeah, yeah. yeah. not nice with but yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that makes a lot of sense. <laughs> cool. I have a question about blueberries too. Um, is there a way to do seed set of the fruit for blueberries? Because I know, like, when I eat a blueberry, I don't detect seeds, but there must be seeds, right? Yeah, yeah, and they're 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 small, <laughs> and they do. Some people have separated them into large, medium, and small seeds. <laughs> yeah. and, uh, they 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 think that the larger ones are viable, but You'd have to follow that through right. to make sure. Right. Um, but yeah, that's that's doable. Yeah. Been looking at Charles Nicholson's work in Vermont. He, I worked on that project, and I was the one who counted all those seeds. <laughs> 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 um, so if you want to see the results of that, that figures out. <laughs> yeah, it's you go blind after a while. <laughs>